What is the purpose of the transfiguration? And then also, why were Moses and Elijah both there? Transfiguration is a monumental and crucial event. We've got three of his disciples who are going to give an account of what they saw, but there's something interesting that's also there that needs to be explained, and that is why were Moses and Elijah, who were no longer among the living, why were they there? This account is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but let's go to Mark chapter 9, verse 6, and listen to it. Uh, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. Now, there's some questions as to which mountain this is. We won't deal with that at this moment, but brought up to a high mountain. Was it Mount Tabor? Was it a different mountain? That's not really an issue at this point, but let's continue. And he was transfigured before him. This word transfigured, this word metamorphose means to transform, to be changed. And we get the same idea in our English word metamorphosis. And so there's something that's happening with Jesus before, right before their eyes. He says, and his garments became radiant, exceedingly white, as no launder on earth can whiten them. Elijah, here it is, get the interesting right here. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses and they were talking with Jesus. So the question is, what was their conversation about? Well, in Luke 9, we find out what it is, 931, who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So what was the conversation about? They were speaking about Jesus' impending departure. Why is that? Well, we'll come to that in just a little bit, which is going to explain the reason why both Moses and Elijah was there. And going back to it, verse five, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then and this is important. A cloud formed overshadowing them and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is important. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus. So therefore, after that, you know, see, you don't see Moses, nor do you see Elijah. So the question is, one, why is this happening? And then two, why is Moses and Elijah there? Well, to answer the first question, why is it happening? It necessarily brings in Moses and Elijah. Now, before we go any further, remember a couple of things had just happened. One, Jesus had just had the conversation with them when he asked them, who do men say that I am? And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And he says, you are the Christ. And what was Jesus' response? He says that flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So he's revealing to them, making it known to them that who he is, he is the Christ. That is, he is God who's appearing with them. He's letting them know that his identity is in his deity. And upon that understanding and that profession of faith, that is what he is going to build his church off of. To go along with that, he's also just let them know that he is going to die, which, oh, by the way, again, is what the conversation was with Moses and Elijah as well. So he's informed them and made sure they knew of two important things and then also tells them to not to tell anyone what they just saw until after he's gone. Now, how does any of this relate? Why is Moses and Elijah there? Why is he speaking about his upcoming death? Why is he uh, definitively revealing who his identity is? What does this have to do with anything? Well, let's go back a little bit. Remember, on the mountain, he makes a statement or the Lord makes a statement. God makes a statement. This voice out of the cloud says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Well, this is not the first time that this has happened. Moses encounters the Lord and the Lord says the same thing to him. In Exodus 23, 20 says, behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious towards him for he will not pardon your transgressions since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. So what does he say? He says this term here, he says, obey or listen to him. The same word that's used here in the Hebrew is the same understanding of the word that's used in the Greek in Mark. Listen to him, obey what he says. Also of importance, Moses wants to see God's face. Obviously he can and he wants to see his glory. So what does God do? In Exodus 24, 15, then Moses went up on the mountain. Again, we're not sure which mountain that they were on uh, when Jesus was transfigured, but Moses on a mountain and the, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai 
and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses from the midst of the cloud. And to, and to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountain. So let's understand this. So Moses gets to see a portion, a small part, a small portion of the glory of God. And what does it do to Moses' face? He has this radiance. His face shines too. The problem is, though, with Moses, he still never gets a chance to see the face of God. Similarly, with Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, he is on a mountain as well, and the presence of the Lord shows up. And in this instance, Elijah takes his mantle and wraps it around his face, covers his face. Why? Because he cannot see the glory of the Lord as well. The problem is we've got these two men, these two important figures in history, Moses and Elijah, who may have wanted to see the face of God, but did not. Now, it's important to understand that Moses is representative of the law and Elijah is representative of the prophets. As a matter of fact, you often hear the divisions of the books divided between the law and the prophets and the writings. And so we have the law and the prophets. Why does Jesus need to be transfigured before them? Well, the law requires that atonement must be made. What does Jesus come to do? He comes to fulfill the law. And how does he fulfill the law and put an end to it? How does he do so? He does so by completing or doing what the law dictates by being the atonement. Remember in Leviticus 17 11, this is during the law, and God says that I have given the blood on the altar to make atonement for your souls. But how he states this is in the Hebrew that I myself am given the blood, which can be taken and should be taken, that I am giving the blood. Well, how could he do so? Because as Jesus just identified to his disciples and as they've been told, he himself is God. Just like Joseph was told that his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus is God with us. And so to reveal this, the glory of the Lord, they get a glimpse, a preview of God's glory upon Jesus. That's why he shone this ray, this white radiance before their face. And so what did Moses want to see? What did Elijah want to see? The face of God, the glory of God. And they got a chance to view that in the person of Jesus. And just like Jesus was fulfilling the law, so too what the prophets have been preaching is also being fulfilled that you're going to have this Messiah the son of the living God, God himself being the being the king. That's also the prophecies that the prophets have also spoke of that this Messiah is coming. And so here we see Jesus being able to stand before Elijah, showing them, indicating that their prophecies are also being fulfilled. Now, it wasn't just Elijah and Moses who saw Jesus being transfigured. It was also the disciples. And we have at least two accounts of the disciples also referencing what they saw in John 1 14 it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and what does he say and we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace so remember this is written after they've made they've seen what Jesus has done now, obviously chronologically in the book the writing this hadn't happened uh, even though John didn't speak about it but still John is writing about what he has seen previously Peter makes the same statement for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Look what he says. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such as an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter is also giving a testimony of what they saw. They saw this majestic appearance, his transfiguration. They saw the glory of the Lord shining on him. And so now we can kind of see the importance of this. This is Jesus making sure that we know that he's just not some prophet. He's just not some disciple. He's just not some messenger of God. He is God. And they get a glimpse of that and they can go and testify of that from now on. Something else that we shouldn't fail to realize is that we literally have the old meeting with the new. We have the Old Testament lawgiver, the person that represents the prophets, also there meeting at the same time the son of the living God with the apostles, those that are establishing the church. I think that part is also pretty significant. And the beauty of all of this is that what was told to Moses, what was told to Elijah, as well as the rest of the prophets, is that they can kind of see it coming to fruition. They can see it meeting up in Jesus, knowing that he is going to accomplish what he said he's going to do and gives us hope and confidence that it's not just any person that died for our sins. It's not just anyone that's guiding us. 
This is the Lord himself. This is God Almighty who has come to redeem us and loved us so much that he would come even on this earth to do the job for us. Why? Because he loves us. So the transfiguration should give us hope, should give us security that the one who began a good work in us, the one that is faithful, the one that's going to see it through is God himself. Amen.